How's it going, Abe? Welcome to another uh, lecture here. We're going to introduce water pollution. Um, we've already talked about the, I guess you could say, the lack of fresh water we have in regards to if you look at the wa water as a whole on Earth. We already know that we only have about 2.5% fresh water. And again, that most of that is uh, locked up in glaciers and ice caps. So we don't have much fresh water. And the other thing that you've already learned is that essentially everything we do from eating and obviously drinking to cooking to washing to industry to creating electricity water is involved intimately involved in our lives there's the uh word that got brought up as the virtual water yes uh the t-shirt or whatever you're wearing um something like that there was water involved in the process of manufacturing that so water is an intimate part of our lives and that's what this chapter is about is one is what are we going to do with that wastewater? Because the other great thing about water is things can get diluted. We can wash things with it. And um, that's what we're going to look at this in this unit, in this lecture here. We're going to look at the three major problems caused with that wastewater that we have. And then we're going to look at how we clean that water. Because believe it or not, probably the water you're drinking, no matter where you are, if it's from a Aquafina bottle, a Fiji bottle, or your tap, it's been used by someone, it's been cleaned, and you're using it again. But without these technologies, we'd be in big trouble. So let's get started. First off, water pollution, it's very self-explanatory. It's any sort of contamination of a water body. And that contamination is going to result in substances that are human created. So again, waste that comes, you know, leaves your toilet or um, oil or plastic, all these things would be considered water pollution. So you flush your toilet, it goes and magically disappears. You don't have to deal with it. And that's what that essentially is the definition of wastewater. It's water that clean water that we used, that we've dirtied, and it needs to be treated. And we're going to notice at the end that even livestock are involved in this because obviously livestock are being raised for our consumption. So again, sewage from toilets and then even that gray water. Quick re review on what gray water is. Gray water is essentially, it doesn't have any chemicals in it. So like the water that was used to wash your clothes in the uh, washing machine or the dishwasher. Yeah, you use soap, but again, there's no toxic chemicals. There's no excrement, human excrement, so we consider that gray water. Two types of water pollution. You can have a point source. A point source thing is we know exactly where it's coming from. As you can see in the picture, that water does not look clean coming out of those pipes. Um, you know that's water pollution. The more difficult one is non-point. And looking at that picture, you can see that the maybe some oil or some sort of fluid from a car that was parked in the street is there. Here we have rain now. That rain's going to go down the uh, sewer and end up in a waterway like a river. So a non-point is an area that produces pollution, but we just can't put a finger on it. So you can see in the picture here, you have non-point. You know, imagine someone in this neighborhood has a car leaking oil oil ends up in the water do we know exactly where it came from no same idea with cropland maybe one uh, farmer puts way too many fertilizers on his or her crops ends up in the waterway do we know which one no and again the point so sources are you know exactly where it's coming from so here we're going to look at as you may know we do have some problems then with wastewater so we're going to look at what some of the issues it has and there's three major issues in regards to environmental science first we're going to look at the oxygen demand we're going to look at how nutrients are released and how this influx of nutrients can disrupt an ecosystem and finally it's going to result in some disease causing organisms where we get sick first one let's take a look at is oxygen demand so you have this term biological oxygen demand. So looking at the picture, you can kind of get an understanding, maybe if this were a pond, the number of organisms are demanding oxygen. Each organism needs a certain amount of oxygen from the water in order to survive, and that's what we mean by the biological oxygen demand. It's just the, the BOD is what we refer to. How much oxygen do you need over a period of time in order for the aquatic organisms uh, to be successful and live? But what we see here is you can, in the picture, you can see that the uh, when you have an increase in sewage in an area, the as you can imagine, a lot of microbes show up. You know, microbes want to take care of it; they want to eat it, and those microbes require oxygen. 
So now we have this biological demand that we were everything was okay here without the increased microbes. We add some sewage. Now there's microbes involved. Biological demand goes up, which means there's less oxygen for the living organisms in that aquatic ecosystem. And unfortunately, as a result, what we get is a dead zone. So these uh, biological biological oxygen demand and dead zone kind of go hand in hand. Because if you really think about it, and here you can see a dead zone off the coast of uh, the United States. And then to give you an idea, we'll look at the uh, Mississippi River in a second. But what's happening again is with that idea of microbes, they're decomposing, right? So they're taking care of all that dirty water. They're breaking it down. They're using it as energy. But again, that oxygen demand is going up. And we know other organisms are affected. And the thing with this is it's self-perpetuating. So think about it. Uh, oxygen demand goes up. These microbes go crazy. They have tons of food. They're consuming the waste. They're needing oxygen. And as a result, organisms die. Organisms die. You have more microbes. Microbes taking care of the dead organisms. Even less oxygen in the water. So it's this constant cycle. And unfortunately, it happens over and over. And... We see this, especially off the coast of the United States, especially in the Gulf of Mexico, um, because you have not only the increased algae and microbes, but you also have increased nutrients, which we're going to lead into our second one. So with nutrient lease, again, that's eutrophication. And what's happening is when those microbes break apart that uh, organic matter, the waste that's in the water, they release nitrogen and phosphorus. And as you can remember back, nitrogen and phosphorus are huge fertilizers. And as you can expect, and you can see in the picture, you got a lot of fertilizer there. You're going to have algae just take advantage of that. So this algae takes, um, takes that nitrogen, takes that phosphorus, and they, we call that an algae bloom. They just, show, they just start growing. They start producing. And this entire area um, is filled with algae. And the same idea as a dead zone. So that's going to be the result is you get this increased fertilizer, you can see this rapid growth, and then eventually the algae is going to die. And as we just talked about, microbes are the ones that are involved in taking care of all these dead organisms. And again, we're going to go back to that self-perpetuating organisms dying, demand for oxygen goes up by the microbes, and we're left with the same situation. And here it gives you a much better idea, kind of what we just talked about. Again, you have the nitrogen phosphorus ending in the water. There's our algae bloom. Eventually those algae are going to die. These microbes need a ton of oxygen. So as they consume the decaying material, they increase, again, resulting in that dead zone. Cultural eutrophication, though, that's where you and I get involved. Humans get involved. You know, eutrophication is a natural process, um, but when... You have these inputs of nutrients we talked about at the beginning. Maybe there's a river along um, next to farmland. Not all the plants in that, on that farmer's field are going to use the fertilizer. You get a heavy rain. Those wash off from the river. That's an example of cultural eutrophication. So just not make sure cultural, you know, it's humans are involved. So to give you an idea, it's happening all over the world. And it, you can kind of expect it's where rivers meet the oceans. So almost the entire coast of the United States, even off in Europe, and then in Asia. So again, you have these just this depletion of oxygen causing a huge disruption in the natural aquatic ecosystem. And finally, we all know dirty water can cause disease. Maybe we've traveled somewhere, maybe South America or Asia, where they suggest you not to drink the water because there are certain disease-causing organisms, organisms in that water. Um, and I think you've experienced each. We're not. You don't have to know each specific one, but may have an idea of which uh, what they cause. But it's important to note: one sixth of the world's population, so about a little over a billion people, do not have access to clean water. So that means they're at a higher risk of these disease-causing organisms. And to add to it, 3.1 million of those deaths could be preventable. All it takes is hygiene and sanitation. So, and the interesting thing about that is of those 3.1 million people, 42% of it is due to, they don't have access to sanitation. And the other interesting thing is half of those people are either in India or China. So you can imagine how just saving lives or a clean water could save 
millions of lives. So, so some th um, diseases you could expect in dirty water, you have cholera. Again, you don't have to know the specifics of each, just have an understanding that dirty water will result in these. Um, typhoid fever is an example of uh, tainted water. We've all had the stomach flu or maybe Montezuma's Revenge if we were in South America or Mexico. And then finally, diarrhea. And what's unfortunate is that, you know, diarrhea, again, in those India and China, you have mostly children or the elderly dying because of this, again, lack of sanitation. And finally, you get hepatitis A is also um, a potential pathogen you could get just from, again, untreated wastewater. So what do we do? Um, you're safe enough. You can turn on your faucet, take a glass of water, and drink it. It's because your water is constantly monitored. They're seeing if anything is in your water. And what they do is they look for indicator species. What these indicator species are going to do, they're going to say, hey, there's a pathogen pr present or there's not. And the big one is fecal coliform bacteria, but you may know of it as E. coli. Uh, e. coli is what they'll do is as the water is leaving the wastewater treatment plant, they will... Um, see the amount of E. coli. You're going to get some E. coli in the water. It's not a big deal. E. coli is found naturally in your stomach. But when we usually have an abundance of E. coli in the water, that tells scientists, hey, that wastewater hasn't been treated and it could cause um, those symptoms that we saw with cholera, typhoid fever, and so on. So what do we do? How do we test this water? If you live in a rural area, and that's important, a rural area, um, you'll, you can expect a septic tank, and it's very simple. The whole idea, I'm going to back up a second, between these is there's two goals of treating the wastewater. One is we want bacteria to break down by organic ways. The organic material is going to break down into carbon dioxide and inorganic compounds, make, losing those pathogens, making you not sick. And the other thing is harmful, pa harmful pathogens are going to be outcompeted by non-harmful uh, microorganisms. So that's the whole goal. So going back to the whole septic tank is you're in a rural area, all the water from the septic tank, or I should say all the water from your house, goes into a tank that's um, usually you have a big, you can see that houses aren't on top of each other. And you have access to a large area of land, so you have time for that water to clean itself. And what happens is it goes through the pipe just like you normally would, and there's three types of there's three, you can see kind of in the picture, there's three layers. You, at the top layer, you have scum. That's going to be stuff that's floating on top. Um, in the bottom layer, you're going to have sludge. That's the stuff that sinks to the bottom. And again, you can imagine what's in there. It's stuff that leaves your toilet, your laundry room, and so on. And in the middle area, though, we have what we call septage, and that's water. And what that water will do is that water will be go taken by a pipe into what we call a leach field. And it's a very, very slow process. And what will happen is this water will slowly add to a nearby aquifer, but as a result, again, you have more non-harmful non -harmful microorganisms there that will outcompete the pathogens, and by the time it gets into this groundwater, it is perfectly safe. Um, if you're interested in a septic tank, every five to ten years, someone has to come out and clean that. You can imagine what they're taking out. They take that and treat it, and you're good to go. If you're living in a city, you most likely your water leaves your house. We flush. We water goes down the drain and so on, and it's carried to a wastewater treatment plant. And the same idea, one, they want to get rid of the bacteria, and two, they want non-harmful -harm organisms to outcompete the pathogens. So you can look at this, there are six steps, and again, it goes to a primary treatment, a secondary treatment where they aerate it, that kind of uh, lessens the smell, and there's a process through the UV lights, they'll add chlorine to some, and again, at the end, what they do with that water is they put it back into a body of water like a lake or a river, and it's used again. Going back to how I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture that, hey, um, you're probably using water from that someone's already used. Last thing we're going to look at are these feedlots. We you think of chickens, hogs, pit, um, cows. Those things need to eat, and when those things eat, those things poop, and that manure has to go somewhere, and there's a huge volume problem. So the other issue is antibiotics, to have those, um, you have all these animals living in close quarters together, you don't want them to get sick, and also hormones to make them grow faster, those will end up in waterways as well. Here's a, give you an idea of how much poop is produced by these animals. So this is you, or humans I should say, 
And I mean, about a ton per U.S. citizen is what these animals are creating. So what do we do with that? The farmer will create a manure lagoon, and a lagoon, as you know, is water. But what they do is they line it with rubber, and what it do? Just you'll see poop and pee just flowing out of uh, feedlots, and they have this bacteria that breaks it down. And the whole goal is there you go. The whole goal is that water will evaporate. You can imagine what's left behind the solid material. Good thing is they can put it on their crops. Um, there you can go, you see, kind of starting to see the solids come out. Uh, bad thing is if you have an inundation of rain or maybe flooding or a hurricane, like in this case in North Carolina, we have a nice river nearby. There's our manure feedlot. Oh no. All right, so um, that gives you an idea of water pollution. As always, if you have any questions, come see me. Make sure you're a hummingbird always.